So I think what we'll do is we'll finish, we'll obviously see if we can finish up conditionals tonight, uh, conditions with, with uh, Ryan. And then uh, Robert said uh, he would jump in for like the, at least the introduction part of it, maybe a little bit of chapter uh, nine if we can, um, but it just depends on how far we get. So basically what I'll do is I'll just turn it over to Ryan and, and let you go. Yeah, for sure. Um, can everybody, you can all see, Hopefully the my uh, screen. Um, yeah. um, I I started like writing out other stuff and then I I, I went through. Um, I'm sure you all do this too. Whenever I have a chapter and I, I I didn't really watch any of the. I haven't really watched any of the other videos before doing this and this actually helped me a lot. Just watching, you know, I watched um, the first three or most of it and um, yeah. And so I. Um, so um, I'm actually just going to use these these slides because um, she actually this, this woman who who did this this was back in 2020 like did a better job than I can imagine. So let me just um, re kind of recapitulate some of the stuff that we went over last week when we finished up with environments, um, and then kind of talk about um, you know the end of the chapter, which is what I, I failed to do. So we. Um, the whole idea of the condition system is, um, you know, to kind of detect, you know, something uh, happening that we deem to be unusual or undesirable or something that we want to make note of. Um, so, you know, obviously this this all works within a sort of a functional you know, programming system. You have to have a function that does stuff, and you know, you want to be able to detect uh, something unusual when it occurs. So um, the three signaling conditions to reiterate from last week are errors, warnings, and messages. Uh, errors uh, kill the, the, the process, and you know they, they fail to execute. Um, so it's it's sort of an end of of the, of the process. Warnings continue. Um, they 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 do run, but you know they do tell you what the problem is. So this can be potentially dangerous if. You know, you're still getting to the end of the functional call and you're getting a warning, but you're maybe you're not even aware of it or you're not, you know, fully paying attention. This this can be a dangerous situation. Then messages are just something that some information that happens um, after we perform. Um, so I won't go into all of the the various stuff about um how we did all I did all this last week. Um and the last thing that we were sort of talking about was um, when we ended was this idea of handling conditions. So, um, oh, excuse me. Yeah. My email. Um, so basically, uh, this you know this idea of condition handlers allow us to temporarily override or supplement the default behavior. So we talked a little bit about try last week as, as a way of trying to like run a function through that to see what happens. Um, the, the only the difference here is we 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 take you know sort of the, the, the functional call and we we're, we're um, we are, we're kind of looking for some condition and if that condition occurs we we get um, you know errors. Um, typically we uh, like we talked about last week this idea of try catches good for errors, but not for messages, because we want try catch um, is, is good for working with things that interrupt or end, you know, the functional call. Um, and then with calling handlers um, is a function that typically we would want to use with messages and with um, warnings. So um, for some reason this is, oh, okay. So yeah. Um, this idea of the condition object is part of you know this this issue of you know we, we get basically two you know pieces of information we get the message which is you know the um, you know the text that we want displayed um, if our condition you know occurs and then you know the call is you know the, the thing that you know triggers that condition so in this particular set setting we we're saying um, you know we're, we're we're, we're, we're noting that there is a, um, you know, a function, you know, that we're trying to, to catch. And so this is our, 
um, you know, this is our message. And we see here when we actually just look at the structure of this, we get, you know, a met, we get a list of two things, which is the message itself, um, the call. And then also because this is, um, I believe, an S3 object. Is that right, guys? Um, so we get sort of more details about, you know, what um, what is underneath the hood here. So, um, like I said, try catch, you know, um, he registers exiting handler so it can be used to handle air conditions. So, um, yeah, so the, the idea being, you know, we want to um, sort of, you know, end the system or end the, the, the process if, if um, we, we, we match the condition, right? So there's the, the, the basic syntax of this is, is we have to have some kind of a code and then we have to have some kind of, um, you know, error function or some kind of function that, you know, tells us what to do when we've met that error condition. So, um, yeah, so we we can um, see here, like if we were to try to add these together, we get, we get an error. Um, it's just in a natural sort of running of the, um, the, uh, the function. But when we add this try catch and we say, okay, this is the conditions that we're trying to run. This is the error code. Um, and you now we get you know this and so what, what's because this shell is not a numeric it's it's uh, it, it just passes us that error as a result um any questions so far by the way no um okay um so, so the with call remember once again try catch was for errors or interrupt situations for you know this we want um, the execution to continue um, once the you know the, the the handler kind of does its business. But so here we have um, a message, and then you know which is sort of the the, the code or the, the 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 conditions itself, and then we have the messages that you know that come out of this. Um, in this case, when we call sort of a a, a, a naked function call, um, it does it, it it brings these messages back in order which is that was one of the things that like previous cohorts mentioned this like it's it's kind of weird that okay so this appears first and then this so just something to keep in mind that like um oops sorry oh um yeah and even though we we sort of write the codes out themselves you know one then two it, it comes out two then one as a as a as a function right um right and then oh um and then call stacks um you know i um i i i i don't know what else i could really to be honest with you i was kind of struggling a little bit like what what's it what is this first of all people will not leave me alone at work um <laughs> oh yeah so for for you know for call stacks i guess um, you know, this is just a way for us to kind of to see, you know, all of the various order, you know, of all the various pieces. So we're using that lobster package here again. And so if I were to create a function of F that then points to G, that then points to H, and then H points to a message, we see here F, G, H, and then message, and then, you know, some of the meta sort of functional stuff to kind of tell us, you know, what else is in this call. Now, if we were to that, that was with, for doing with call calling handlers. But if we were to do try catch, um, it's all in the context of the, that you know sort of thing. So we're not seeing you know the same sort of list of, of functional calls. It's all sort of within you know this the, the, this issue of the try catch. So um, let me see. Yeah, and then I guess I I I, I was. I was trying to think of a way to like kind of talk about custom can so you can they talk about using the abort function as a way of like including a, a, um, a you know a custom error message right so if you know if the thing is you know we don't we don't have the thing that we want then we at least you know you can add a, a function so it's more informative um but uh, yeah that was pretty much all you know, this, this idea of, um, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, this is as far as I got really. Um, I mean, I, I, 
I see, you know, it just, this, this chapter was just, was such a bear. I don't know about you guys, but I, I read this like three times and I'm still struggling. Anyone else? I definitely need to read it over. I'm a bit behind on some of those. What's that? <laughs> no, I said I definitely need to read it over because I'm, I'm also just like a little bit behind. Um, yeah. I, I will say that because I, and uh, I guess when I get to chapter nine, I, I'll say that, Alex, I'll say it early. I always like flamed out in advanced star around chapter nine is where yeah. um, that's it's kind hard, of where man. I broke down. <laughs> um, but um, I will say like reading this again, it does make more, a lot more sense. Um, I mean, still, at least to me, like when I look back like a couple years ago, uh, from when like I, you know, tried to fail to read all of the Nits are. Um, yeah. So I don't know. It's like definitely makes more sense. But yeah, I, I definitely have to like look this over again. Um, I think what's also like hard too is um, unless like you're really developing like packages and like software, right? I feel like it's a lot harder to like do this. Maybe I don't know about you guys, but like in your like day to day work, right? Where yeah. um, it's a lot more, you know, like analysis focused, right? You like your code. Um, I'm not necessarily writing functions that are like, you know, doing all this like error handling stuff. It's usually like, hey, I need to like do some analysis. Here's like a CSV or here's like a, a plot or whatever, right? Um, so I'm not like thinking about it. Uh, or like, I guess I don't have as many opportunities, right, to like apply it. Um, but, you know, maybe, maybe that's just a yeah. problem of, of yeah. you know, figuring that stuff out. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Hadley makes that argument too. Like if you watch some of his stuff, it's not in the book, but if you watch some of his stuff, it's like he draws a distinction between there's like a continuum of people who are use our people and people who are develop our, right? And so this yeah. is like, I think condition handling especially when you start getting into like custom condition handling is like that's develop our stuff right like yeah. if you know you're going to be developing a package that is going to be used by a lot of people you know especially if it's going to be open source or if you're you know constructing something internally that a lot of people are going to use then you probably need to lean more on this yeah so that you can inform people of like hey there's something wonky going on with your code, you know, you're trying to use this code in a wonky way. How can I communicate that you are using it in a wonky way? Yeah. So, but I did, but I did, I did come across a situation where I thought this would be beneficial. And if I had some more time, I would try and contribute to it. But there was, there's a package called GT. So it creates tables. And oh, yeah, a, GT, yeah, that's a great package. Yeah. So there's a function that I came across in there that just didn't make any sense to me. Like it was like, I think it was like format number and it mm. just kept giving me this like cryptic error, cryptic error, cryptic error. And I'm sitting there and like, I found out it was because I wasn't passing in like the correct number of arguments or what mm. it was expecting. And so I was like, you know, like this could be improved if there was just a very simple error check or condition handler that said, hey, you're not passing a vector into this blah, 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 blah. You know, it would have made it that much better. Yeah. So I, I don't know, just kind of reading this, you see it. Sometimes you're like, oh, this could be better if they would have wrote it this way using this condition handler or something like that. But but do you even need try catch to do that? I mean, you could just like, couldn't you just put like an if else statement or something like where you say, if it's not, you know, a vector or something. Um, well, I think, well, I think that's where this idea comes in, this idea of, you know, where he, where he does this like the if is dot numeric if yeah. is dot numeric base like it's like hey yeah you do get an error to say that there's something wrong but there's like more infrastructure that you could build around it to be more informative to you know give somebody like a heads up of like hey you're trying to pass this type of value into this rather it should be this kind of thing you know so it, <sighs> Yeah. you know yeah you could do that right but i think it's just i think it's just one of those things of trying to communicate more information to make people be faster with your with yeah. your package or your code or whatever so i will say this too i mean like to to ron and your point about like being a user versus a developer like totally resonates with me i, I think yeah i mean all of us are users and trying to become more like developers which is cool you know i think there's it's not a black or white thing i think there's you know there's different levels and but I will say this, I have made functions where after the fact, you know, I had ambiguous um, functional, you know, things were like, 
I hadn't set aside like what happens if I, you know, I, I pass it a missing value, you know what I mean? Or like, um, or a, um, a non-numeric. And so, yeah, I have had situations where I thought, oh, I make, I have this great function that's doing all this stuff for me. And then I, you know, I go back and go, wait a minute, I should be getting different things that I'm not getting because I didn't put any of these sort of control structures in place to tell me if, you know, hey, there's a missing value here or there's a non-numerical, you know, whatever here. So no, I, I definitely see the value. I think it's just um, applying it is is just, it's really hard. I think for all of us, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's a challenge, but yeah. Um, I'll leave it there though. And um, unless Ron, you, you have any other, uh, Ron's cool. Uh, okay quiet today but hopefully if you have, if you have any other comments or... no i mean i'm just going to echo what robert said and what call on all you guys are saying this is kind of a little bit of a challenging chapter because you don't when you're doing date like you're not normally in that developer mode and so you don't oft, often i mean often you're just like oh i'm gonna crank through this analysis and if something goes wrong then i'll go back and fix it i'm not gonna put a little special case in there oh make sure to tell me next time since i'm the only user type thing right so yeah. Yeah, but maybe it'd be a good habit to get into to start putting I mean, there's almost like an assertion type thing like, oh, I know this is supposed to be this here. So maybe I'll put like, you know, a, you know, a stop and if and then do, do a stop if it doesn't match what I think it's supposed to be at this point or something to help debug things. But yeah, that's, yeah. About, the, that's about all I'm going to probably get out of this chapter. To be no, honest, yeah, maybe, maybe it's reading. like you, you like I think slowly it's do it. Um, like what you're saying, right? Yeah. Like you're just like adding like, you know, maybe you have um. I don't know, maybe you have like something like pulls from like uh, the database and then you're like, oh wait, like there's an error where, um, I don't know, you entered in like a table doesn't exist, right? It's right. like, oh, you entered this in and like that could be like super, something like super simple that maybe gets you more in the habit um, of uh, the video you know, practicing. Yeah, that. so, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I found that chapter not that entertaining and um, it's okay, I mean, it's fine. Like you don't have to understand every damn thing in this book. Right. I think a lot of it to me, and I always remind myself of this, is that it's you now know about this. <laughs> yeah. And so when you see it, you now know where to look and you know you've seen it before and you, you know, I kinda I, this is one of those chapters where I when I'm reading, I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Oh yeah, I get that. That's good. Then when I'm done, like, well, I retained almost none of that. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. And I and, and I, I'm a little worried now with Robert said, like, this book does get a little hard. I noticed during chapter nine that the exercises seem to be a lot more challenging all of a sudden. I don't know if that's, to be honest, whether or not he's just now gotten late. You know, hey, the writer's writing this book, too. He's got to get him running out of steam, too. So maybe Hadley at this point is like, well, you know, I'm just going to put this really challenging exercise in the middle here for some reason. <laughs> Yeah. Like there's one like asks you to implement span the span function from Haskell. He doesn't. It's not even right. That's not how span works in Haskell. So I was confused by that. Yeah. You know, I thought it was funny. I forget what I looked at. I said, I give up and look at the solution. It was like, it's like a page and a half solution. Like, well, no wonder I was going to whip that out in a couple of lines. Um, (laughs) um, I forget which year. I think it's like the first cohort, but the woman who actually, I think it's the same woman who did these, the slides that I, you know, I I, I cribbed, but she said her problem with this chapter was, is that the examples were too example y, which I, you know what I mean? That's great. That's Um, great. I mean, that's like, you know, I get that, that I never knew I needed until just now. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that there is something about that that is like, yeah. And that's probably a common thing in a lot of, you know, you know, um, coding and stuff. Hey. So I think my point was let's give ourselves permission not to understand everything and we can <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, it's one of those things where like, like you said, Ron, it's like you, you come across it when you're coding and then you like recognize it and you're like, oh, I, I know this little thing. And it might help you just solve like one little problem at that moment. Right. And so it's great. just good. Yeah. Which is good. And so, you know, and I've had some of those experiences too, going through this is like, I come across a situation where I'm like, oh shoot, I can't solve it. But I know that if I do this one little thing that I can go and solve it. And so it, it, it comes up here and there. So Cool. Well, awesome. I appreciate it, Ryan. I uh, really yeah. appreciate you taking on the challenge and taking us through um, chapter eight. And so I think what we'll do is we'll switch over here to Robert and we'll start talking about introduction and see if we can jump into uh, functionals. So, yeah, cool. 
Uh, do you guys see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Um, here, wait. I one sec. I don't like that. Uh, why is it doing that? Uh, oh, whatever. It's like I, I always want my zoom on this screen, but it's whatever. <laughs> I don't really care. That's, you just have to uh, stop sharing like, and then reshare, I guess. With what you want. Oh. Okay, let me do this and then enlarge in this and. I, I don't even it's whatever <laughs> so long as you so long as you guys can see it like I, we I just see don't care. <laughs> uh Corto, yeah Corto awesome. mark now. sweet um cool so this was honestly unlike chapter eight which i think was you know not not the most fun um chapter to go through i i really enjoy chapter nine uh like i said this was the chapter that usually i uh, uh got through kind of uh, an undergrad and uh, sort of got it, but not really. And that's kind of where my advanced art journey stopped. Um, this honestly on another read after I think just like a bit more years of like program experience and like data analysis work and also doing a bunch more stuff in Python. Um, a lot of this stuff really clicked for me and truly I, I, I had a blast even like, I didn't go through like all the exercises still need to like do like, you know, like the span stuff and like some of the other uh, exercises, but I think a lot of it just like for me at least really clicked. Um, and I really just, uh, really just see, I think, like the value of PER, um, for kind of like abstracting way of lot like typical iteration stuff, right? That you can just like give to you know a mapping function and like think about more of like uh, the underlying like logic what your code's trying to do. So, uh, I'm just gonna start with the introduction, right? The introduction is all about you know like functional programming, what is it? Um, so there's like the technical definition of functional programming. Um, I, I think in like Hadley says this, um, it's not like as relevant, right? I mean, if we want to get like technical definition, right? He outlines it, uh, that functional programming languages have two things that make them, you know, quote unquote functional. Um, one that our functions are first class. So they're like, you can just, you know, any other like type of object. So in the case of R, right, it would be, um, things like, you know, vectors and lists, right? You can use them the same exact way. You can pass functions to other functions. You can assign, um, functions to names, right? So it's like, that, that means that functions are first class. Uh, functions in functional programming languages are also pure. Uh, so this means two things. One, it means that the uh, output of a function is, is uh, fully determined by its inputs. Uh, and you know when you run it with the same exact inputs, you'll get the same output. And a function has no side effects. So there's actually a bunch of our functions that break this rule. Um, for functions that aren't pure, you can think of like any of the, um, any of the functions that let's say draw a random that like draw a random value from like a statistical distribution. So like, let's say I want, you know, 10 values from a, a standard normal distribution, right? If I do like R norm 10 and each time I run that, I'm going to get like a vector that's different, right? In each run. Um, so that would be something that isn't pure. As for side effects, stuff like um, writing files to, you know, um, you know, disk, right? Um, that's an example of something that has um, a function that has side effects. So that would be, you know, an example that that function is not pure. Um, but again, like, it's not really like, you know, you can get into like kind of the academic discussion of like, oh, what's a, what's a, what's a functional programming language? Um, well, I let's think get that, into that. No, I'm just kidding. I do want to <laughs> just make one comment though. Oh, sure. Forgive me. And that I oh, disagree yeah. with Hadley on this and that functional programming languages should support uh, programming with pure functions, but many and most functional programming languages do not ha have this constraint to only pure functions. Mm -hmm. um, some of the most popular functional programs like SML and, and uh, F sharp, and they use side effects to make things happen. And they basically use this, what he was saying, where you break down and you try to separate out the impure aspects and the pure aspects so that they operate separately. Even Haskell, which is a pure functional, one of the few, I think I only know two off the top of my head, Haskell, and clean, and I don't think anyone even knows probably even heard of clean anymore. It's an old nope. <laughs> language a long time ago. So uh, and even they support side effects, but they just do it in a really strange way that just makes this separation absolutely concrete. <laughs> There's no way to get around it. Um, so yeah, anyway, I just want to throw that out there. Pure having only pure functions is not a requirement to be called a functional programming language, in my view. Got it. No, yeah, I, I think I, I think I agree with that. Oh, yep. I think Lua, I think Lua too might be, I don't know. I've just dabbled in a little bit of Lua, but I think Lua might be first class too, but Lua that's is, just a yeah, very, but it's not, it's not pure by any means. It's not pure, but it's yeah. first class, right? Yeah. 
for something sure. like that. But anyways, that's this isn't a Lua conversation. So. <laughs> but R is a functional language. It sure is. Yeah. I mean, no, it's yeah. kind of hybrid, but it definitely is a functional language. It meets the real definition. Yeah. And I think like, I think the most important thing I right, right with Hadley talks about this is um, like adopting more like functional style. So like um, when it comes to like code, right. So that, you know, you can think of that as like, you have some like big problem. I, I think dplyr is probably one of like the best examples of this, right. Where you have usually like some more complicated data analysis tasks. You want to, you know, select some variables, maybe do some filtering group by computer some summary statistics. And all of those operations are given like one, um, you know, one verb, right? I mean, now at Deepwater, it's gotten, I guess, a little bit more complicated, but like the same underlying philosophy of like breaking down um, those operations into individual functions, I think still holds. Um, and I think like our really compare to even like something like Python, honestly, um, definitely feels like a lot more centered around functions. I mean, like with obviously with like Python, you know, you know like pandas and NumPy, right, which are, you know, functional. Um, but I, I will say that like, at least writing code in both of them are definitely lends itself more to that probably because it's also like everything is vectorized um, our, so in my view r supports strongly supports and advocates for a functional style whereas yeah python guido has said many times that python is not a functional language yeah no <laughs> so, i remember so he's he, actively, he doesn't like reduce yeah. i remember he's like i yeah. hate reduce Matt i want to like, get rid of yeah. it yeah. um so you know what i'm talking about yeah <laughs> And, and like, even in like, you know, you can use like, you know, map and Python, like I've used it. It's a bit weird. It's yeah. not like, it's a little bit like, it's not as easy to just like pass a function, you know, to like some iterable in Python and like kind of get the thing you want, especially if you're doing like, you know, work with like pandas data frames and it doesn't really give you the thing you want. And then you're like, well, I guess I'll just write a loop <laughs> to kind of do what I want. Well, list um, comprehensions though are awesome, so. True. No, list comprehensions are pretty. That's the way you do um, mapping in Python, right? Yeah. No, of, of course. I wish um, you had that in R. <gasps> Wait a minute. I'm going to write that library right now. <laughs> <laughs> you could. You could. Um, it's like, so, I, I don't mean to derail this, but um, I remember I saw someone made a tweet about the um, not having, uh, you know, plus equals, right? If I like oh, want to yeah, add I, uh, something. I and then some, and then someone just like, well, I can just, do, I can just make it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, yeah, you could just, you know, make, make a, a little function operator for that. Um, but yeah, I, I think like, you know, main takeaway in the intro is, um, it is more important to like, you know, break down problems and like into functions and then like combine those functions, um, you know, it, it, to like solve some sort of bigger problem. Uh, the technical details of like, what's well, a functional programming language, you know, obviously aren't, um, as, oh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> just, for, for of, course someone did. <laughs> of course someone did. I love it. I just Google um, it. So yeah, you know, that, that, that I think is really the intro. Um, and I think it's like, especially like when you start with R, you don't like think about these things, like everything is literally kind of like a function and, uh, to a certain degree. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's like good just kind of, um, you know, peeling back that like, you know, kind of like defining it a bit more concretely and then like showing you this like cool stuff with per. Um, but yeah, so Anyway, you know, we're going to be focusing on chapter nine, but this whole next two chapters after chapter nine are going to be focusing also on like, you know, functional programming stuff. So chapter 10 will be about function factories. So that's like functions that churn out other functions and then function operators which is chapter 11. Um, I, I, I like skim chapter 11 because I'm like, this sounds weirdly similar to chapter 10, uh, but apparently this is like similar to decorators in Python, which I don't really fully I get. So right. yeah. Um, but that'll be fun. So I, I'm super excited for this, um, this stuff. Um, so yeah, let's start uh, the chapter and let's, you know, see how far we get. Um, so, um, you know, a functional, right? We're just gonna define it. It's just a function, you know, takes another function and returns a vector. Um, so super simple. I, oh, you know, like, let's say we have this function randomized, right? Which just generates, um, you know, has some sort of like function, right, that you pass to it and um, generates, what should I call it, uh, a thousand uh, draws from a uniform distribution. So, you know, we can just do randomize and then, oh, I want to get like the mean of that, the meaning of it again, I want to like sum up those values, right? That's just an example of the functional, super, um, super simple. Um, also, just one little note, right? For loops are like bad at R. It, it's really weird, like, <laughs> people I think like kind of dunk on for loops that are a lot. Um, mostly I think it's like, and, and Howie right does mention this, it just depends on like the operation that you're doing, um, you know, right? Cause like R's copy on modify semantics, right? Like you could be, 
doing something like super inefficient. So I think it, it was right in the, uh, I want to say it was like the first chapter, right? When he was kind of showing like looping over a data frame creates all of these like copies, right? Especially if like you're modifying a row. Um, and so it's not really that loops are bad. It's just like, you just need to be more cognizant of the stuff that like you're looping over. Um, Cause like our loops in general are kind of just like slow and like, you know, Python too. Like it's not like, you know, compared to like something that's vectorized. Um, so it's not like, they're inherently slow. It just depends what you're doing. And I think that's like a good call out too. Um, because you know, sometimes you're like, I can't figure out how to like write in a map and fun, you know, like a functional right now. I just know what the loop is and you know, just write the loop. Um, you know, there's no nothing bad about that. Um, but yeah, so the first our first functional is gonna be the mapping function. Um, so we define some function triple that just takes a vector and just multiplies every element of it by three. And what do we get? We get a list um, where each element, right, is like each element of that vector. So for one, we multiply that by three, right? Three, two, six, three times three, nine. Um, and this is like super, super neat, um, I, I think, right? Where you're really just focusing on um, what the operation you want to do. It's like, oh, I have this vector, right? One through three, this integer vector, and I want to multiply each element of, of it by three. I mean, granted, you could just, you know, Multiply by three without, <laughs> without um, you know, making the function as without talking about it. But I think it's like just like a kind of a good example of right, showing like kind of like the power of what you could be doing. Um, I don't have the graphics in this, but I absolutely love them. Looking at it, where it kind of like breaks down right. We have like this vector. Well, you have like right. You have map right, which is your function. You then have some vector, and then you like pass it a function, and that function is called on each individual element of um, you know the vector that you pass. Uh, this, by the way, I don't want to interrupt every ten oh, seconds. No, person, but this I think is interesting because you'll notice what it actually returns is a list, and it's like because you use map, right? Yep. And this is one of the things I think that makes, in my view, going through this chapter makes R harder than Haskell in some ways, right? Because, or even Python, because in especially in Haskell though, there's one map function and it just, it always is more like um, modify. It just knows mm -hmm. that whatever type is always returns the same type. Uh, and it seems, it seems very natural, like you map onto a, and the other thing yeah. with Haskell is most, I want see all only data structure you ever use is a list. <laughs> so it's not like lists and lists in, in uh, are more like I don't know anyway. Um, lists are more like vectors, I would say, but um, and that they always have the same type. So I think things get a little more complicated because you have to deal with you know all these different types of mapping and all these you know and you get confused because like oh I I tried to do this map and it came back weird. Especially if you like use the base R functions, so it's like what is going on? Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's what I found like this chapter is a little confusing for me. I'm like wow, there's all these like special cases and uh, dealing with the different types of objects that you could have. Are all handed like I, special cases and it requires a lot more a matrix of possibilities in your mind. Yeah, at least for me, I guess for my, I didn't find it as confusing, I guess mostly because like, I'm just grouping it about like, what is this like family of stuff do, right? So like, right. you know, map, no, get map, that. yeah, like map list, list and then you have all, right, like map, we'll get into like map double, map character, yeah. all that stuff. And then you have like the walk family, P map, all of that. And at least for me, simplifying it just down to that, and then just remembering yeah. that, like, when I need a specific, you know, uh, vector of like a specific type, right? Then it's just adding in that suffix. Um, but but I, I do agree, right? Because it's like there is now like twenty of them, or like whatever, right? Um, it just bothers me when more. I look at that thing. It says map one to three triple, and I get back this weird thing back, this list. Like what? That's not what I expect from like <laughs> yeah. my experience with every other language in the world that does map, right? <laughs> no, that's that's totally fair. Um, oops, sorry. Um, what I also like too is that this, you know, sometimes I think you have some opponents, right? Let's take Guido, right, as an example, <laughs> um, where it's like, th this is more like, oh my God, fuck. I think like a lot of engineers, I just noticed this from like my own experience. So anecdotal, kind of, you know, dunk on func functional programming languages, right? It's like, this is way too confusing. But like, this is all it really is, right? You just, and obviously there's more like complicated stuff, right? As Hallie says, um, you know, it's obviously written in C++, there's some more, you know, error handling, but this is really like the core of it. You have some output list, right? Just for map and you loop, you loop along the loop, Jesus, you loop <laughs> on the indices of the vector um, and you just put it back in the list, right? And you apply some function to it for each element of it and that's it. 
And that's actually, I think I'll, I'll get to a little bit more later. This is, I think, super powerful because I don't know about you guys when sometimes like I read like code with like a bunch of loops, it seems to me really heavy. I would say, especially in R, maybe because like all the brackets, like if I'm writing loops in Python, I don't find it as heavy to like read. But um, I think sometimes when you're like re reading, right, like a lot of procedural code, at least for me, there's like much more of a like an overhead I have to keep in my mind about like what's actually happening. Whereas I'd rather be focusing on like the operation itself rather than like all of like the bookkeeping stuff. Um, you know, teacher and right, I know there are people who'd be like, no, like that, that makes it more like the procedural code makes it a bit more clear about what you're doing. But like, to me at least just saying like, okay, map iteration and applying this function to this vector. And to me, that's, that's super cool. Um, yep, so. Uh, so right map, you know, as Rob was saying, it returns list to be a bit confusing, um, but uh, per does have um, other types of like mapping functions. So let's say I wanted um, a, let me also just read this in. Um, let's just say I wanted a character vector, right? So I take, you know, empty cars and I want what are like the types of um, each column. So type of will turn a character vector. In this case, I get now a named character vector of each of the um, data types of each column and empty cars. Um, map logical, right, return a logical vector, uh, saying uh, which, um, in this case, I'm passing it as double. So I'm saying, I'm asking which, um, which columns and empty cars are double vectors. Um, I can then create like my own function, like what are the number of unique, you know, uh, number of unique values right in each column. I can pass that to, um, you know, map int, right, which integer vector and I get, all of the counts, right? The unique counts for each column. And then maybe I want to compute the uh, the mean, right? Of all, of all the columns, right? With empty cards, so I can just pass it uh, mean. And again, this is super cool, right? Where it's like, you're really just focusing on, again, like the operation, not all the kind of like bookkeeping code that I think you sometimes have with loops, which isn't to say like loops are bad, right? Because also at the end of the day, this is a loop, <laughs> right? It's, it's just under the hood. You're not really like, writing the code to uh, think about that. But I like it because it, again, like it abstracts that, I think like the less important details of like looping over this, doing all these operations, having the output type and like making sure, you know, you don't get like an off by one error, all that stuff. Um, just focusing more on like, what is this thing? I'm, what is the thing I'm actually trying to do? In this case, um, oops, sorry. Um, I am just trying to, you know, get the mean of all the columns of empty cars and that's it. And that's you know pretty clear, and then I can continue reading like other my code that I haven't read read in a month, or somewhat uh, you know a coworker's code or something like that. Um, with all the mapping functions, it must the output must return the same type as the input. So as an example, let's just have this function pair, which just you know repeats the whatever's passed to it uh, twice. Um, in this case, if I use map double, this will fail, right? Because um, I'm because the output type in this case, um, it'll be, you know, it, I'm just thinking of the image, right, where it's like each element of this vector, one, two, so now it'll be, uh, I'm, I'm now, my output type is now of length two instead of length one, so it's going to say, hey, you can't do this right. Um, as you can see, this is actually a pretty good error message. Um, you know, it must be a single double non integer vector of length two. Um, if I also now try to pass it a uh, function that coerces uh, the input to a different data type. So in this case, I have um, map double, one uh, integer vector one and two, and I want to coerce that to a character. Um, it will also fail, right? Because um, I, with map double, I'm saying that the output should be a double vector, but as character obviously coerces the vector to a character, so it'll throw an error. Um, for it, for the, in the case of pair, you can just use map, right? Because um, Right, list can have like an any element of list can have like any arbitrary size to it, um, and you know now it runs without you know failure. Um, I can also pass you know as dot character to um, map as well and get back a list, but it's probably just simpler. You know, if I just want to like coerce these this integer vector to characters, I can just do you know as dot character. Or honestly, you could just you know if now I'm again thinking about it, just as dot character. <laughs> you know, don't even need the map. Um, but yeah. I wanted, so, I wanted oh, to yep. jump in here because I think this is like a really important, it's, it's a very subtle thing that Hadley talks about, but I think it's really important about this idea of switching between map double and map. 
And it kind of goes back to what Ron was mentioning before of like, well, why isn't map just like modify in the entire thing? Mm -hmm. I think part of like, like the, I think like part of the like really cool thing about this design about having map as its base to output a list is in situations where you might have like a lot of computation or you're doing a lot of iteration where in that iteration, there could be like an error or something. And so what's nice about this is because it outputs a list, it can output any number of objects uh, from that operation, but then it opens up the ability to do functions like safely and possibly. So like, say you have something that's doing like a long iteration, right? Or a long iteration that takes a long time, a couple minutes or something, and it errors out. If it errors out, nothing gets outputted, right? It just stops, breaks, error. But if you have a list, you can output everything and have like a function like safely or possibly run everything. And then you could able, be able to pick through that list to see where the errors were. And so I think this is like a really, it, it was a very subtle thing that I think Hadley talks about in the book in this chapter, but I think it's a really important design feature that I think is really, really kind of neat, so. I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm glad you uh, interrupted and said all that because actually was answering a question. I was running around in my head I'm like, wait, why didn't they just call map map list and modify it should have been called map. But now I kind of see why that is. They wanted kind of the default behavior with the simplest three character thing to, to work for most things so you could figure out what the heck was going on. So uh, to summarize what you said in a very non. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's yeah. just, it's just like, the, I've, I've used safely quite a bit because it's like one of those things, like if I'm making like, if I'm making like a call to an API, like a paged API, and I know that API is not, you know, it's not, it's not very, uh, I can't think of the term right now. It's not very stable, right? Or it's going to push like an HTT pair, like a 404 or something, and it's paged. This has saved me so much time because like what I can do is I can figure out what's wrong. So um, yeah, I just, I, I like this, like this part of it is like really cool because I think it just opens up to many different like options that you can use with map, but I didn't even think about that. No, I just made a comment that, that safety is a function operator. It's like a chapter, a chapter 11. Oh, oh nice. They're going to use neat. <laughs> Exciting. Cool. Um, cool. But possibly so, yeah. is a homework problem. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, or right. Oh yeah. So yeah. Now anonymous functions, right? So, um, you know, sometimes, right. You're like writing some code and you're like, I need to like make a function, but I'd like, why name this? Cause I'm probably not going to like reuse it. Right. You can just use an anonymous function. Uh, this is the base R way of doing it. It's a little bit verbose, right? So you have to like define like function X and then like unique X, uh, with per, um, you can pass it using like the familiar R formula syntax. Um, you can just pass a little tilde. And then length, you know, unique dot x dot x in this case, right, referring to empty cars. And the reason, you know, this is a bit more concise. I think there was one example uh, where actually I preferred the base R, um, the base R way of doing it, just like it made the code a little bit more clear. But in general, I think this was like to me, I prefer um, this syntax. I also know R has like some another like lambda syntax. I think it's like you know the. I could just write it. Um, it's like this and like X or something. And that, that looks yeah, I hideous. put it in the chat. Got it. <laughs> that that looks hideous to me. I don't know. I, I don't really it. like it. I, like I don't. It I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I need to write with it a bit more. But like, I, I'm a big fan. I don't know. Like like the tilde. Uh, but maybe you know. Maybe I'll be a convert. Who knows? Um, but the reason right right. Uh, this even works is because of this as mapper uh, function at the back end that if we run it, uh, you'll see um, it converts right your little this little like tilde formula syntax. Um, it who uh, which we call it it converts it right just to a function call. So like if you looked at the documentation, it would say like if you pass it a formula, it'll just convert into a function, which you can kind of see here, um, you, like function right, and then whatever you know what my the little... function body is. What the little angle bracket lambda angle bracket thing is that is printing out there? Is that, is that something that the that uh, is that like for the class? Uh, I think it's some. I don't know. It could be like an R lang thing that I couldn't tell you and don't. Okay, I, I didn't know if I'm something you know because I'm like, what is that? That's cool. <laughs> I, I'm assuming. Seen... Yeah. No. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, I, I had nothing. <laughs> 
I've, I've come across this function as mapper one time and I was trying to find the blog post where I saw it, but I think it's a type of function that you're defining, but I'm trying to find the, 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 the blog post that I came across that talked about it. I know Colin Fay talked about it one time, but it was something where he was creating like fun. He was using that as mapper to create functions to which then he passed into per, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll see if I can figure out how to find it. Interesting. I think, that's I don't cool. know. I don't know. I have, to, I have to look it up and I don't that's even cool. know if that's this, I don't know if it's proper syntax anymore, but. No, I mean, that's cool. If, I mean, but if you find it, I would love to give it a look, but yeah, that's what as mapper does. Just, you know, takes this formula syntax, converts to a function. Um, and this is, you know, pretty useful if let's say you want to generate like some random data. So, you know, use map and the integer is one through three. And in this case, I just want a list with three elements with um, two random draws from a random uniform distribution. This was kind of confusing me because I'm like, why does this work? <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not fast to get at anything. And I want to say like this kind, I could be wrong. Um, this kind of might work due to like lazy evaluation, right? Because in my head, this is kind of where I was thinking before, um, whatchamacallit, before this uh, call, is like, if I look at, you know, let's say I pass like one, right? So one to, um, let's say it's a function, right? The, the argument is X. If I'm never evaluating X, I'm always just gonna call what's in the function body. So that's kind of why I was thinking like, why this even works? Because I don't know, in my brain, I was like, Where's the dot X? But right, I guess that works because I've never actually like doing anything with what I've passed to the argument name. I'm kind of butchering this, but um, yeah, I, I, I don't think know if that made any sense. <laughs> I think you're, I think you're on the right track, but I think it's because dot X is what gets passed first, right? So yeah, so dot X would be the vector of one through three, and then the second positional for the run uniform or R U and F would be the the two, as I think is what's happening. Maybe. Well, here this is actually honestly, if I wrote it out like this, like let's say I had like this is called test fun, and let's say I do like function X R U and F two. Um, so to me, right, if I like, oh shit, um, you know, test fun two, I'm never referencing X, right, at all in test function, right? Um, yeah, so that's fine though. But that's fine. I, and I guess let's, well, at least my brain was going more to like lazy evaluation, right? Because since I never access X, I never really like, do anything with it. I'm just calling the body. So even if I like, you know, passed in this whole thing. It's vector, true. I think X wouldn't be yeah. evaluated. What if it, um, I which is I like X would ever be evaluated, but it doesn't yeah. matter. It's not used. So, yep. But that was just like, I don't know. I, I was like one, two, three, doesn't matter. Basically it could be when you map one, two, three to that, you could have mapped ABC. You could have mapped anything, right? C, you know, it wouldn't, it doesn't care. <laughs> oh yeah. No. Yeah. I, I think it was just like, I remember I was doing three, this three, three, plane. Give the same answer. Um, I was doing it as a plane ride back from LA and I was like, why is this working? And I think it, like, I was just trying to like figure out like, like mechanically, right? right in my brain yeah it wasn't like clicking but you know really easy right you don't have to like again no loops pretty nice um also what's really nice about this this one like i like it i, I like i love this funk i think this functionality is great if a little bit i i, I now none of this is like confusing i just think it's like in a way you might be overloading it a <laughs> yeah you might just be like overloading a little bit too yeah. Right, where it's like, let's say I have this like deeply nested list, you know, maybe you're working with like some like web API data or like something, you know, website scraping, right? Super nested JSON data. And um, it's really nice about, uh, right, with these map functions is that they are internally powered by the pluck function in per, which, you know, takes some sort of list and like extracts, you know, elements from all the sub lists. Um, so you can use the, you know, the map like double or whatever, like character um, to like extract it. You can extract it by name. So let's say I want all of the, um, all of the X components right in each sub list. I can do that. I can extract the pipe position um, for each sub list in X. I can do, I can combine name and position by passing in a list. Um, now there are instances in which like, you know, I want to grab like some component from all these sub lists and it fails because maybe one of those, um, one of those sub lists like doesn't have a component. Uh, so that will error out. 
but you can then um, pass dot default to it and then like give it a default value. In this case, if um, one of um, whatchamacallit, one of those sub lists, right, doesn't have like the element. I think this is really neat. It's a little too clever for me, I would say, in the sense that like, I would just say that you just use pluck. I think it's a bit it more so, I think conveys like the intent of the code um, a bit better. Again, cool. I like it. I'll probably use it here and there, but I think like pluck probably is better for when like you have to read your code in a little bit or like someone else, right? Because in my, in my mind, it kind of overloads like a little bit too much of like what mapping is doing, right? I'm like applying some function to each, um, whatchamacallit, um, to each element of the vec of, the, of my input, right? Um, which I guess, I mean, pluck obviously is like just a generalized form of, you know, our, our the double, double brackets, um, which obviously is a function because everything in R is a function. <laughs> um, but also like, I don't know, it, it's a little bit like to me, uh, it kind of obfuscates a little bit, but that's just like a little nitpick. Um, but yeah, you can do that too with the map map uh, map functions. Um, these these actually come in like I, I agree with you. Now that you said that, I totally agree with like the the cleverness. Right, it is clever. Mm -hmm. But I think what's really nice about this is when you pipe them. Like if you create like a like a chain through pipes. Mm -hmm. then I think the intent is a little bit clear, but I do agree with you. Why wouldn't you just use pluck? Yeah. So I do agree but, with you on that. But yeah, I mean, just that's like such a slight nitpick, right? Um, I still think it's pretty cool. Um, you can like obviously do that. Um, and then again, you don't have to write all of this like looping stuff, right? Um, you're like, after, then you're like, wait, crap. I like did something wrong. Um, this is pretty neat. And I, and I do have to say, I am a little biased because I learned iteration and how to do this stuff with map first before I learned for loops. So like, like, this, so like, so when people are like, oh, I'll just write a for loop, I'm like, yeah, but you can use map, but that's just because I'm biased because that's where I learned iteration yeah. from was through map. I learned iteration through map first before for loops. So I was a little bit backwards, but. But in some ways it's like easier, right? Like, I, I, I don't know. Now I like. Maybe it's because, again, I've done a lot more, been doing, I've been going way more back into R lately, but since I've been doing some stuff in the Python, like I can just see the loop. Like I know it's like I could write it out, but um, I don't know. I, I like this a lot better in some ways, right? Cause it's just, again, it's like, I'm focusing on like more of the operation I'm doing, not the kind of like, you know, boilerplate loop code. Um, next little bit is uh, passing arguments with, you know, our, with dots. Um, so anything, so obviously many functions have additional arguments means a really good example of this, where if I want to remove um, missing values right from the vector, um, you can just, uh, since every map function has, you know, dots, I can then just pass any, you know, additional arguments um, to that function. Um, so you can do this. One way you can do it is like not to take advantage of dots. And you can just say, you know, use an anonymous function like we do um, over here, right? Um, but again, a simpler way is just to, Take advantage of dots, and I can just pass um, na you know dot rm uh, to mean, um, and then that um, that that essentially any additional arguments are always just like passed to the uh, function without any like modification. Um, the only rub where that actually might be a difference is um, between like anonymous uh, passing additional uh, uh, additional function arguments to an anonymous function versus just uh, using dots is. Um, since it with uh, passing it to an anonymous function, it will get evaluated every time that function is called, right? So whatever that length of the input you pass, whereas with um, passing it to uh, with to dots, um, it'll just be evaluated once. So pretty, it's actually a good example of this where I have some function plus, which just adds, you know, two, two numbers together, X and Y. Um, with um, passing uh, R, U, and F, right? So just taking a draw from a random uniform, uh, distribution, this will only get evaluated once, right, as uh, you can see here, whereas um, if I pass it uh, to an anonymous function, it'll get evaluated four times, right, because I'm passing it a, a vector of length four. Um, so that's like the one little rub, but, you know, just something to keep in mind. Um, argument names. So why are they called dot .x and dot .f? That's a little bit weird. <laughs> um, and the reason why is just because there are times, right, with a lot of functions, we'll just have like maybe arguments that are literally called X and F. And this is essentially just to prevent um, 
name con like you know errors. An example is like our simple map function. Uh, in this case, bootstrap summary has uh, argument names X and F. So that simple simple map also has that. And then we're getting like an error um, error over here where it doesn't like know which one to pick. Um, so that's why it, that was like you know pretty simple. Also in general, and I guess like I think we'll get it to here. Um, you know, varying another argument. Let's just say um, I have you know I guess this is a thousand draws from a Cauchy distribution. And I want to like try different. Um, I want to try like trimming it, you know, trim trim means with different values. Um, but obviously, x in this case, I want it to be constant. So I only want to vary trims. So a really easy way to do that is, um, you know, just passing trims, right? Um, is the argument that I want to vary in this case. x in this case is constant. And then I just vary, um, vary trims right and this was the example i was saying in the per style it's a little bit um it's a little just bit less uh clear i think mostly because like the variable name is just called x right and dot x and you might be a little bit confused whereas like the base r uh, way of uh, passing anonymous function i think in this case makes the intent of the code a bit clear um that i am you know taking each element of like trim right passing and passing it to you know mean and just like that returns right a uh, double vector of um, different like trimming um, applied to this um, this vector of a thousand draws from a Cauchy distribution. Um, this is also being a bit clever, right? Highly, highly pointed out. Don't do this. Um, you like really shouldn't do this, right? You could like rely on like R's very flexible argument uh, name matching, but this is like kind of confusing because this now relies on you knowing that trim is the second argument to mean and like you probably shouldn't do that, um, even if it's like, oh, wow, this is like super concise. It's like way too concise and way too clever, right? Where like you read this, you're like, what am I doing? Or like someone reads this who probably doesn't know that the second argument it's a mean is trim. And they're like, what are you doing? Um, so don't do that. Um, then there's some exercises. I just want to point out one thing that, again, I kind of really liked, and this was like super simple, um, was uh, exercise six. You just use map to fit uh, right linear models to the empty cars data set with these formulas that are stored in the list. Um, this was really cool because I think I remember, I, I don't know, I, did, I definitely think that this like some of these exercises in undergrad, I could not for the life of me get through if, even like these ones, let alone the span function. <laughs> um, but I think what was so cool about this is like, it's just one line. And it's also super clear is that I'm taking formulas, I'm varying each input. So I'm just like, and you know, fitting like these different um, models, right, to empty cars. And I'm saving that as a list. Um, you can do it with a loop. Loops are also like not hard, right? You just like have some output vector, which is list. And then I loop through um, all of the formulas and save it. You know, it's this output list, right? And I get like the same, uh, the same thing. Um, but again, like you have like to me, it's just a bit more heavy to like read. Um, where like, you know, I have to like define the loop body and like, I'm being a little bit like dramatic, right? Like this is still like pretty easy to read, but um, I don't know. I, I just really like this one um, where like, you know, you took this like list of things and just a really quick one-liner that I find just a bit more readable than the loop form. Um, but yeah, no, I, I don't know. I, I just wanted to call that one out because I thought that was like very easy, <laughs> right? To, to do that. And again, like then you're just focusing more, I think on like, the actual problem you like have probably all these like different candidate models you want to like get fits on them and then you know, like maybe you want to like do some evaluation and stuff um so i thought that was yeah. cool well that's a i think this is probably a good stopping point yeah um, since we're getting into the next section and it's already five o'clock um but <clears throat> i really appreciate how far we got uh tonight robert and um like you said with that model that one actually kind of saved me uh, this week because I was fitting some time series models and it, it was great. It kind of helped me, you know, pass some different models and some try some different stuff out. So it was, uh, I, I echo what you said about that. So um, looking at this, I think probably just next week, what we can do is just finish up chapter nine and then the following week go into chapter 10 functionals. Um, I think that will probably be the best because I think we yeah, still get back in sync. Yeah. Yeah, yep. and so I'll take on function factories for chapter 10. 
Ron, I think I have you set for function operators. I think I'm yeah. gonna have to do some managing of this, like of this, uh, of the schedule a little bit. But I'll... it's fun messing with that spreadsheet, and not messing it up. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, it is what it is. We'll get we'll get back on track. So um, I think we'll finish up chapter nine next week, and then yeah, I mean, if you guys want to hang out and talk for a little bit more or talk through some stuff, happy to do that. But you know, obviously it's five o'clock, so I don't want to hold anybody if they got things going on. So yeah, I, I did uh, find that. Will, oh. Did Ryan say something before he disappeared? Uh, he messaged me, said that his oh. laptop just rebooted. Oh, no. So oh. <laughs> it was too, Great. it was too much loop loop. Our uh, map was <laughs> too much uh, for his machine. <laughs> I did find that Colin Fay article that talked oh, about cool. perm wow. mappers. And in fact, I just got reminded that he did like six different blog posts of like using per like in like more of kind of like application wise. So there's like a lot of material. Oh, like, nice. I'll definitely this one that. talks exactly about that idea of using that function called as mapper to define a function that you pass into map. I still probably don't understand what he's doing, but Colin Fay is like, next level <laughs> he just he understands it at a very deep deep level and doesn't as mapper actually in cause call a different function called as function if it's a function it's, yeah mm -hmm. so i think it i think if, if, if it's you a pass it a function or, yeah. it just passes it as is if it's a formula it will then convert it to a function oh, okay. um if it's a if it's an mm -hmm. integer it creates a special kind of thing yeah when would I? I'm trying to think like when. It's an integer that creates a pluck function, I guess, right? Yeah. yeah. When example. would I? I'm just trying to think like when, because like I get the idea of what it does, right? That's like if you pass it some formula, converts to a function. I'm just trying to think like. Why not use a lambda? I mean, I, yeah. Well, I guess like I'm trying to think like, um, hmm. I, I, I should honestly just read it because you know, yeah, I'm kind of like speculating. <laughs> I'm kind of speculating. Well, no, this article. He might so say this. It's a this. five minute read. We can do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I really enjoyed this chapter a ton. It makes, it clicks way more, way more for me. Um, like, uh, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes being in like Python world a lot, you're like, Jesus, I write too much procedural code sometimes uh when i'm doing like some especially like a panda sometimes where i'm like this would just be easier if it was dplyr <laughs> this is, i don't have to mess around with indexes or like i just want these column names and like pandas is like oh well, you need to write it i guess pandas does have the filter function which doesn't filter rows it filters column names because impeccable naming um <laughs> from pandas but I don't know. This was this was fun, and uh, you know, getting more back into R. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited for function factories and function operators. I've already kind of read function factories a little bit, but it's beyond anything that I know how to do. So, like you said, this is kind of at the point where I'm getting to like really pushing my knowledge set. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I'm really gonna have to like. I'm really going to have to like really, I'm probably going to struggle with function factories, but hey, it's just one section function, pro, functional programming. Then we get into objects, OOP, yeah. and then we get into yeah. objects, and then we get into metaprogramming, which I did read some metaprogramming stuff and that just like with quasi quotation and stuff. And I, I just don't, I don't get that. <laughs> I just straight <laughs> on. Hasn't that been do, um, a little bit simplified, right? With the, uh, the double braces. Yeah, if you're working with dplyr, but like yeah. when you're trying to when you're True, trying to integrate that with other functions yeah. and other things, I ran into that issue, and you're just like, oh well, I'll just slap two curly braces on it. Doesn't always like, work. No. Oh. And then you have to learn how to. Then you have to go back to like the bang bang and like the walrus, and then I just I, I can't wait to get to that chapter because I ran into that issue this week, and I was like reading, trying to see if I could read it to get some <laughs> quick wins. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, Robert, Colin, thank you. Uh, yep, Ryan check you later. Virtual yeah. world. Thank All you, right, Ryan. We'll see y'all. Right. Bye, Good, good starting <laughs> week. See ya. You yep. too. Bye.